Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I see a lot of smiles. That's good. Always good when you're smiling. Uh, unless, of course, you've done something wrong and you're trying to hide it. Uh, in that case, then I'll just let you handle that however you see fit. Hey, um, it's going to be really hot today. It's going to be really, really hot today. So praise the Lord for functioning air conditioning units. Oh, man, it feels so good in here, and um, I know later on the day it's going to be a lot warmer outside, and so uh, I hope you'll have opportunity to, to stay out of the heat today to some degree. I want to tell you a few things before we get started. Uh, there are updated prayer lists uh, on, the, on the little uh, table outside there in the foyer, and so you want to grab one of those before you leave today if you haven't already. That'll give you up-to-date information based on this past Wednesday night, and you can be uh, praying for our church family and all the needs there uh, the rest of this week before we meet again this coming Wednesday. Uh, also, uh, all in the bulletin, there's all the information you need there. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I'm so used to saying this event is coming up and this thing is happening at this time, and then I, I can't, there's nothing to, to say right at this moment, so uh, it's kind of got me out of sorts a little bit, I'll just tell you that. I'm, I'm so used to looking and saying, okay, don't forget about this coming up. Uh, one in particular that's on my mind is uh, our monthly men's fellowship that we would do every, the last Tuesday of every month, and we haven't done that now in, um, this will be the fifth month that we haven't uh, had an opportunity to do that, and I, I don't know, I'm just missing that a lot. I'm missing that, that uh, smaller group fellowship. So I pray, and I hope you will as well, that uh, these circumstances that we're dealing with right now uh, will be coming to a close sooner rather than later. Uh, we don't know, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that when we get into our, our Bible teaching time a little bit later this morning, but... Uh, as it, as it would happen, our text for today kind of lends itself to that subject a little bit, so we'll talk about that uh, a little bit in an illustration type of way. So uh, before we get started, uh, you've got what you need. If you've got a prayer list and a bulletin, you've got information you need. I wanted to read just some scripture for us this morning uh, about something that's been kind of on my mind. Uh, I've been just um, made more aware this week of how difficult and how challenging our world can be. And I'm talking about just day-to-day -day life. Nothing, um, nothing extra or nothing significant more than just normal, everyday challenges that we face in life. And, and my friends, those around me, those whom I inter interact with uh, on a weekly basis, just knowing what all's going on in people's lives and, and challenges people are facing, uh, life is difficult. It's just, it's just challenging, and there is a, a reason for that. Our, our world is uh, it's just racked by sin and wickedness everywhere you look, it seems. Has anyone else just had that thought at all? They just, you look around, and the world we live in is broken. Uh, if you haven't had that realization, I think it would be healthy and helpful for you to just spend a few moments and think, and think about uh, the world in which we live and, and why it's so challenging. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. And uh, we try to compartmentalize sometimes to try to minimize the, the effect of that on us in life, but on, maybe on our family. But, uh, man, everywhere you look, there is sin. There are the effects of sin everywhere we look. And I, th I think that's why we need to be even more uh, purposeful about what we're doing right now and, and how we proceed forward as a church and as individuals. Uh, I have some scripture this morning that was on my mind earlier today from Psalm 51. And I, I, I don't know if you know, if you've uh, looked at that lately, Psalm 51 is connected to the story of David in, uh, earlier on in the Old Testament 
when David sinned against God, he saw Bathsheba, he, I mean, he, this guy, it's so interesting to think, this is a person who God said is a man after my own heart, and yet he was an adulterer, he was a murderer, I mean, he, he, did, some, he did some rough things in his life. And this particular psalm, if you look in your Bible, if you were to look at it, it would say in the, in the top part there that it's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, after he had sinned and had, had, her, wife, had her husband sent to the front lines of the war and had him killed and all the sin that, that he wrapped himself up in. And this is his prayer of forgiveness. This is his prayer of repentance to God, and as I thought about the sinful world that we're living in, and this, this came to mind about how he repented and prayed to God for forgiveness. I just want to read the first few verses here of this psalm, Psalm 51. Here's what David is inspired to pray and then to write. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now listen to this. This is one of my favorite verses. Verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now... That's all I'm going to read of that this morning, but here, here's why that, that verse really resonates with me. You know, every time there's sin, it affects all kind of people. You know that? Did you know I, if I sin, it doesn't just affect me. It affects my family. It affects my friends. It affects my church. It affects my spiritual walk, my personal life for sure. But if I sin, it affects a lot of people. So here's what's striking about that verse. David says... As he prays to God, against you and you only have I sinned. Now to me, that's just kind of a, that's a profound statement, and here's why. David's sin affected Bathsheba. It certainly affected her husband, whom he had killed. It affected his uh, position as leader. It affected all the people he was leading. It affected a nation. But in his heart and mind, he sinned against God. And that was the most important part of his sin. He sinned against God. And, and until we realize all this sin around us, it, it affects a lot of people. Our world is broken. But first and foremost, our sin is rebellion against a holy and righteous God. And, and until people start to recognize the depth and the, the harmful nature of sin, I don't know what will happen in our world. And this is why it's so important that we as Christians really strive to be in the Word and to live a godly life, uh, not just for our sake, but for the sake of those around us. If we're going to make a difference in this world, we got to really, really make a a, a a goal and purpose in our lives uh, to focus our eyes on Jesus. And so I hope this morning as we sing and, and just remind ourselves of the, the grace and mercy of God, I hope as we pray, as we give, and then as we study the Word, man, I, it's my prayer today that our hearts are going to be impacted by spending time with Jesus and with each other. So would you join me in prayer as we pray for that very thing this morning? Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you uh, for the privilege we enjoy this morning, even in the midst of uh, an uncertain time and uh, uncertain circumstances in our world, in our communities. We have our privilege to come before you to gather with your people, to gather in your name, to gather for the purpose of being changed in our hearts and minds. 
being exposed to your word, uh, having the blessing of fellowship, the blessing of worship and praise and prayer and generosity. There's so many things that we'll experience this morning that are, that are gifts from your hand. And so, God, we thank you for all your blessings today. We thank you for the, the blessings and the privileges we enjoy by being your children and being able to gather uh, for your presence today. So, Lord, I pray while we're here and even beyond that time, while we're here, Lord, would you, would you speak to us? Would you uh, make yourself known among us? so that we might be changed, that we'll be more focused on Christ, we'll be more in tune with your word, we'll be more intent on loving and serving other people, especially right now, uh, in the midst of a sinful, a, a wicked, a crooked, perverse generation, as you say in your word. Help us to shine like lights in the darkness. Help us to do your will for your glory and for our ultimate good. We pray you'll be glorified among us today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand and, and sing some worship to God.
before we get started, I just want to say, you know, not every church, uh, let's see, how can I say this in the nicest possible way? Uh, not every church is blessed with uh, people who can sing, people who can play the piano, and so I just want to say, uh, Jackie, Patty, thank you so much for everything y'all do uh, for this church and uh, how you lead in worship. I, I really appreciate it. Not, not everybody has that, and so uh, I'm thankful for that. Today we are going to be continuing back in our study of the book of Acts, and we're going to be in chapter 6, just the first portion of chapter 6. And the title of today's message is called A Biblical Chain of Command. I know that sounds kind of odd uh, before we read the scripture, but uh, let me try to put it in context before we get started today. John Maxwell is um, known for his writing uh, on leadership. I want to read a, a short, just a sentence quotation from John Maxwell uh, about leadership. This is from his book, the 21 indispensable qualities of a leader. He says, Everything rises and falls on leadership, but knowing how to lead is only half the battle. Understanding leadership and actually leading are two different activities. Dr. Maxwell explains that the key to transforming yourself from someone who understands leadership to a person who successfully leads in the real world is character. And when he says character, he is referring to these qualities that he writes about in this book, these 21 different characteristics or character traits that um, some are natural and some are learned behaviors, but they all uh, contribute to the overall uh, ability to lead. You know, I heard, heard someone say one time that uh, if you get too far out in front of people, you're not leading anybody, you're just out going for a walk by yourself. So you've got to be careful that people are actually following if you're trying to lead in a particular direction. So if you take those, um, those principles and the statement that John Maxwell makes... And then you try to put that, couch that into spiritual terms. The Bible gives qualifications for elders, pastors, and deacons. Uh, that's a, the biblical word elder is commonly what we would refer to as pastors, uh, those who are qualified for that office. And so you have these pastors and deacons, and uh, especially in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write some very specific qualifications for both of those offices and so we're not without information when it comes to knowing what uh, a leader should look like and so they're I mean they're pretty straightforward they're pretty clear and I'll say this if churches follow those things when searching for leaders then things tend to go well but if the pastors and deacons follow those things while serving the church then things tend to go even better so it's, it's a joint activity. Uh, people look for certain characteristics for leadership, and then leaders should exemplify those characteristics and even work to improve those characteristics. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that seems like that's, that's a, a key component of good leadership, godly leadership. So here's when we throw a little wrench into that program. Let's see in this text today what happens when a church, a relatively new church, starts to experience growing pains. The bigger the church, the more complex and maybe the more um, consistent the challenges that are set before that church. So let's look at Acts chapter 6. We're just going to read the first seven verses and then we'll talk about what the Lord has for us here in this passage. Acts 6, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, as Luke writes, God speaks through him. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews 
against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Speak to us clearly as we have your word before us and your spirit within us. I pray that we will have understanding of what you're teaching us today. And Lord, please help us to be obedient so we might follow you and your leadership first and foremost as we try to make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this seems like an interesting little passage, but it seems like it might be a little out of place if you just first glance at it and you think, well, we were just talking about uh, this guy getting healed and people preaching the gospel and the church growing and all these different things happening, and now all of a sudden it seems like we're caught in a little logistical issue, and like, like a behind issue. And so, why in the world w- would we need to learn about this? Well, it's very important in the context of what we're learning about the new church, the New Testament church, and the movement of Christianity as it's spreading. It's important for us to know one, one little tidbit of information. Everything's not just unicorns and rainbows when it comes to church. It just doesn't work that way. Now, we saw already that there's persecution. We saw from preaching the gospel that there's opposition, right? The religious leaders pulled the guys in, Peter and John especially, and uh, they arrested them, then they had them beaten, told them, you're not going to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And, of course, what they do? They went and kept right on preaching and teaching, which is great. And that's why the church was growing. That's why the word was spreading, because they were obedient to God, and they were not deterred by the opposition. But now, this is outside opposition that we've talked about, right? This is the church mobilizing to preach the gospel like we're supposed to do, and then the outside secular world pushing back against that, okay? Even in the form of these uh, religious leaders in Jerusalem, it's the outside outside of Christianity, pushing back. Okay, But now that's not what we're talking about. Now we're talking about challenges, issues that come up within the body of believers. Okay, So the first thing that we can see here, right off the bat in verse 1, significant growth presents new challenges. Significant growth presents new challenges. And I say significant because... What, you see, we're only in chapter 6, just into chapter 6, but what's been the progression so far? Pentecost was in chapter 2, right? The very first sermon, Acts 2.14, Peter stands up full of the Holy Spirit and starts preaching the gospel. And then by the end of chapter 2, what happened? That number of 120 went to 3,120, right? And after the first, first day. All right, so then after the man is healed at the temple gate, and all that transpires in chapters 3 and 4, then the number of men has risen to 5,000, which means just the men were 5,000, not to mention the women and children. So the church was much larger than that. Then, by the time we get to the end of chapter 5, twice in chapter 5 at least, we keep keep reading that phrase, and the church, uh, the, the number of disciples are added daily. Those who are being saved, right? So the church is continu- We don't know the number, but we know it's growing. We know it's more than 5,000 men plus women and children at that point. So that's a good thing, right? So you read, here, here's the continuity. 
you know that there's significant growth, exponential growth, but, but look at this. Look at the, the switch over from where we ended two weeks ago, the last verse of chapter 5, and the first verse of chapter 6. You look at Acts 5.42, here's what you read. Every day, and then remember, this is after they got beaten severely and got released. And they count, remember they said they counted themselves, uh, they rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering shame for the name of Christ. And then so, look at verse 42. Every day, in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So there's no coincidence here. They suffered. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Then they kept right on teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. They kept right on doing what Jesus told them to do and what the world told them not to do. Okay? Now, look at chapter 6, verse 1. What's the very first thing we read? At this time, the disciples were increasing in number. That, that's not an accident. See, when, when, the, when the people of God are obedient to the mission of God, then you start to see and experience the glory of God. And the disciples were increasing. So there was no stop to the growth of the church, the growth of the kingdom, because... The people were obedient. So verse 42 in chapter 5, the last verse there. Remember, remember, there was no uh, chapter and verse numbers when this was written. That was added later. So it's not 542 and then a new chapter begins. This is just a continuous narrative. So there's not that break that we have. So you see, every day in the temple from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And what was the result? The number of disciples were increasing in number. Okay? So what happens as you see that significant growth? You see a new challenge. And this is, this is ironic because you would think, you go back to Acts chapter 2, you see that picture. And even in Acts chapter 5, everybody had everything in common. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. All those things were going well. They were one unified family. But as growth happens, complaints, right? You see that in chapter 1? I mean, chapter 6, verse 1, excuse me. A complaint arose. You have two groups. You have Hellenistic Jews, which now you have, you have Greek-speaking Jews versus native Hebrew Jews, okay? So they're all in the same um, ethnic group, so, but they have two different languages. So what happens is... Uh, the Hellenistic widows were being overlooked. They didn't feel like they were getting uh, equal treatment when, when they were, you know, uh, what was happening in chapter 5. Uh, everybody was bringing stuff to the group so that everybody's needs were met, right? So that means that while that was happening, uh, somebody had to be distributing food to widows because you see in, in the book of James, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God is this, that you look at, after the widows and look after the orphans and keep yourself unstained from the world. That's, that's pure, undefiled religion. So they're, they're taking care of their widows and orphans. They're distributing food. But someone, some group, felt they were being uh, neglected. So it's a legitimate problem, legitimate issue, needs to be addressed. So... Significant growth presents new challenges. But then number two, good leaders find good solutions. Verses 2, 3, and 4, you see the apostles, you see that verse 2, the 12, they summoned the congregation of the disciples. So they grabbed the multitude and they, they gathered everybody together and they said, here's what's happening. They explained the situation. There's an um, a issue of neglect among these widows. They feel they're being overlooked in the daily food distribution. But look what they say about the priorities and how they know their purpose versus what needs to happen. So there's never a denial. I want you, this is very important. There's never a denial in the text that the, that the um, issue is a legitimate issue that needs to be fixed, needs to be addressed. That's never mentioned. 
So we know it's a, a legitimate thing, needs to be addressed, needs to be fixed. But look how the leaders navigate through it. They explain the situation and they say it's not right for the elders to neglect their primary task. And so what they're saying is, in, in not so many words, and you look at verse 2, the way they say it, in order to serve tables, is there something wrong um, about serving the food? No, absolutely not. That's a ministry. That's a ministry in God's family. But what they're saying is, it wouldn't be right for them to personally be involved in that task. They say they have a primary role to fulfill, and so the current challenge could be handled by other members of the body. So then they explain the situation, now they explain their plan. And they tell the multitude of disciples, they say, select seven men from among you for this task. But then they tell them, not just any old men. This is a physical need, but it's a spiritual need. Okay? Remember, everything's spiritual. So they say, select seven men that have these characteristics. You see what the text tells us? Make sure they have the right character to accomplish the task. They should have a good reputation. They should be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. So when they give those directions to the multitude, to the congregation, look what they say in verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to our primary task. What is the primary task of the elders, the apostles in this situation? Prayer and the ministry of the word. So you have a clear issue that needs to be addressed. It's a legitimate issue in the family of God. And so the leadership says, we have things that we need to be doing, and we can't neglect those because they're our primary task. But you can find people, there are plenty of disciples here that fit this bill, that have this character, that are able to fulfill this need in God's family. And so they say, here's the requirements, find seven men that fit this bill, and they can do it. They can, uh, they can satisfy this need. So the apostles are going to devote themselves to their primary task, prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, number three, good solutions benefit the body. When you get to verse five, how does the multitude of disciples, the congregation, how do they respond to the plan that's offered from the leaders? It found approval with the whole congregation. Can you imagine that? We're talking about thousands of people. And it was unanimous. It says it found approval with the whole congregation. That's amazing. That's a miracle of God right there, isn't it? For thousands of people to be unified in one direction. So it found approval with the whole congregation. And who did they choose? They selected seven men. Now this is interesting. The first one and the last one, you get just a tiny bit of extra information. But the rest of them, you just get names. You just get their names. So Stephen is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Then you have the, the next five, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas. And then the last one, Nicholas, he's a proselyte from Antioch. So the significance of that, we're not fully sure. We, we're no, we know what the significance is for Stephen because as soon as we're done with this, from here to the next chapter and a half, almost two chapters, is all about Stephen and what happens to him in his short-lived ministry. So we know, that, we know about Stephen, but we don't know about Nicholas, and we don't know about the other five. All we know is this. They were men of good reputation. They were full of the Spirit and full of wisdom because those were the requirements set forth for this task. So they selected the men. Now, what did they do with them? What did they do with them? If you look at verse 6... It says they brought these men before the apostles. So what I, what I really want to kind of zero in on here in this whole process as we get to the end of what happened is there is cooperation. There's distinct roles. 
You have the 12 who are the, the apostles. They're the leaders of the congregation. There's no mistake about that. And you have the multitude of the disciples, all the congregation. But do you see that there's, there's harmony in the way they're working? There's cooperation. The leadership lays out a plan, and the plan is, is, is wholeheartedly accepted by the congregation. And so they work together. The, the leaders lay out the plan. The congregation fulfills the plan. They bring them back say, hey, here's who we got. And we followed those criteria, and we, we are confident that these men can do the job. So they brought them before the apostles. What was the purpose for the apostles having a, a final little stamp of approval there? They prayed for them. They, they prayed for them. That's not a minor detail. What should we do? What, what do we do before we embark on ministry plans or um, mission trips or service projects or whatever it is we're trying to do as a church? What do we do? We pray. We pray that God give us the right direction. Give us um, godly influence as we go and serve under the, the name of Jesus, that we're, we're getting that authority, we're, we're identifying with Jesus. That's who we're serving. And so we're, we're going to pray before we go out because we're going to make sure that we have the influence and the direction and the leadership and the power of God covering the efforts we're about to embark on. Does that make sense? D do you know how senseless it would be or how how foolish how dangerous it would be to just presume that i'm going to go out and i'm going to just i'm going to do something for the lord well, i'm not going to pray about it i'm not going to ask god to be with me i'm not going to worry about god taking care of every little detail i'm going to just go out there and and do it well you know we shouldn't be surprised if things go wrong, or, or our expectations aren't met, or uh, maybe we don't get the result we're hoping for, if we don't, if if we if we think that we can just if we if we look at this as a machine, let's just look at God's church, God's work, God's ministry, God's mission. It's just a machine, and you know. If, if we just keep turning the crank on that thing and just keep it running. It's going to just run by itself. It's like cruise control. It's going to just run by itself. Yeah, it's like, it's like a, the, the, temp, the foolish temptation of a preacher. This one. God, I've been, I've been studying the Word. I've been developing sermons. Uh, I went to school. They taught me how to... I know how to do this. I'm not, I don't need to pray this week. I don't need to hear from you this week. I, I can this is an academic exercise. I can do this. I don't need your help. Just you just go I know you got more pressing things to deal with in this world. There's so much stuff around happening. So you just go on to deal with the important things and I got this, God. I, I can handle this. I don't need you to help me preach. Really? That's that's one of thousands of examples. Folks I need a little a dose of reality. And here's what it looks like. Are you ready? Are you listening? I can't take a step without the provision and the sustaining power of God in my life. I can't draw my next breath if God doesn't say it's okay. Do, do, we under, do we even grasp, do we comprehend the amazing re, uh, de dependence we have on God? It's so easy. I'm, I'm telling you from personal experience, it is so easy to just drift off and think, no, I got this. I'll call, God's my 911 operator. I'll call him if I get in trouble. But I can handle everything else on my own. That is nonsense. I can't handle anything without God. Amen. The simplest of things. 
the things I may have done all my life, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter. Without, if, if, if we don't understand, especially when we are presuming to go and serve in the name of Jesus, and we don't understand that we need Him. What does the hymn say? I need the, when? Just on Mondays? Every hour. Every hour. We can't exist. When we read in Acts, we're going we're gonna to see it when we get to chapter 17. He gives to us life and breath, and in Him we have our being. We, can, we don't exist without the power of God. Do you understand that? We don't exist without God, and yet we'll presume to just go out and do whatever without Him, without uh, following His direction or seeking his face or his will his leadership when these apostles prayed and laid their hands on these men they were reminding everybody every church since that moment even something a task that they're, they're distributing food that seems pretty basic right even in something that simple they prayed. They laid their hands on them. They, commis they commissioned a team of people to hand out lunch. How does that differ from our mindset? 2,000 years removed. Are we that mindful of our dependence on Christ? at every moment or do we just kinda casually say, nah, I got it I can I know, I've done this a hundred times I can I don't need I don't need to pray before this I don't need to seek God's direction or his will in this I, I know what I'm doing you hear that do you hear the the arrogance in that statement I know what I'm doing I'm telling you this, this just came really home to me to realize just that little, that little phrase. And, and it's so easy to skip over in verse 6. After praying, they laid their hands on them. They were acknowledging their dependence on God for everything. Even to pass out food. Everything. Significant growth presents new challenges. Good leaders find good solutions. And good solutions benefit the body. But finally, number four, godly leadership benefits the kingdom. The kingdom of God. Verse seven's kind of just thrown in there as a, hey, let's see how we're doing. Let's do a little progress report. Because verse six is the end of the story of the selection of the, the, here's the issue, here's how the, elite, the leaders dealt with it, the congregation was on board, they selected the men according to the criteria, the men came forward, they were prayed for, laid their hands on them, and presumably then they went out and they took care of the issue, right? That, that's not in there. But look at verse 7. This is, this is such a, a great, it's like a, tying a bow on the top of a present. Verse 7, the result. The word of God kept on spreading. So you know what that means? Look where we've come. Verse 1 says, the disciples were praying, but then a, a complaint came up. A complaint came up. So presumably then, while the number of disciples was increasing, something was a potential roadblock for that increasing of disciples. Now look what we have in verse 7. The word of God kept on spreading. The number of disciples, look, continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. Not just a little bit. See, verse 1, the disciples were increasing in number. Verse 7, the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And the last one might be the most ironic of all. <laughs> I love this. A great many of the priests... So fun. Does anybody else find that funny? I just find it hilarious. A great many of the priests 
we're becoming obedient to the faith. You, now, be careful that we know who, who he's talking about. Who's a priest? It's not the apostles. It's not the people teaching Christ as the Messiah. It's the priests. What do the priests teach? Judaism. They're, they're not, they weren't saved. They're still looking for a Messiah. The apostles are the Messiah. So this says that the word of God kept spreading. The number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests, like they were coming out of the synagogues, getting saved. Do you see what just happened? People are being converted. Leaders. Priests. You know who was um, interrogating Peter and John? The priests. <laughs> you see what just happened? God just did a miracle. And it's all because, the, the, from the leadership all the way down, everybody was following God's plan. Unified. The leaders saw an issue. They came up with a solution. The congregation was on board. They all worked together. They were, going in the, they were pulling the rope in the same direction. And what's the result? The word of God kept spreading. Number of disciples kept increasing greatly. And even religious leaders of other faith traditions were getting saved. We're becoming obedient to the Christian faith. That's amazing. And, and all that, and we would even entertain the thought that we don't need Jesus. <laughs> That, that's just, oh, it boggles your mind. It boggles your mind. So how do we conclude? Good, godly leadership is a blessing to the body of Christ. But it's not about building a bigger church. It's about building the kingdom. Because if you build the kingdom, God will take care of the church. Does that make sense? See, you can, you can build your personal kingdom if you want to, if that's your priority. You, you can build a personal kingdom and make it all about, well, we got to be the biggest church in eastern Aiken County. No, not just eastern Aiken County. We got to be the biggest church in Aiken County. You know? Busting at the seams. Well, guess what? There's plenty of things we could do to make that happen. I mean, we could make it happen in a, in a few weeks, probably. We can build a crowd. Might not want to call them a congregation. We could, we could get a lot of people to show up. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to just tell you. There's a certain lady in this church that I see sitting back there that if I just go feed a couple dozen people her baked beans, we'll have them lined up out the door. I mean, that's just the truth. We could get people here. But, but what are we trying to do? Are we trying to build the kingdom? Are we trying to see disciples increasing greatly? Priests becoming obedient to the faith? See, in order for things to work the way they should, we have to, everybody's got to do their part. E everybody. There's no, no one is excluded. I, mean, I, want, I want the Word of God to keep on spreading. I want the number of disciples to increase greatly in Wagner. I want religious leaders of other faith traditions to hear the gospel and be saved. I, I want all those things to happen. So here's the question we all have to ask ourselves, each of us. We have to ask ourselves this question. Am I doing my part by the power of the Holy Spirit of God to see these things happen? Because we, we can't talk about the church until I talk to God about me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity and time we've had to study your word I thank you so much for your blessings and I thank you 
most of all, that you are worthy to be praised and you are 100% able. So it is safe for us to depend completely upon you. When we say and realize and acknowledge we are dependent on you, we're safe. Our faith, our dependence is not misplaced because you are able in every way. If we will simply humble ourselves, surrender and submit to your leadership, to the power of your Holy Spirit that is at work within us, you will accomplish great things for the glory of Christ, for the good of your church. And we will get to take part in those things. And we will experience amazing things in our own lives simply because we're dependent on you. So help us to, to observe this biblical chain of command as we submit ourselves to you first and foremost and then we find our particular role in the body of Christ and we fulfill it help us Lord help us we need your strength we are dependent on you we need you in our lives to accomplish what you've called us to do so help us we pray in Jesus name Amen Well, tonight, um, don't forget, at 6 o'clock, yeah, 6 o'clock, we've got our students meeting uh, at the parsonage in the living room for their Spec Ops Bible study, and then we've got in here, we're going to continue on our uh, study of Revelation. We're actually going to be in chapter 4 tonight. It's a really, really good chapter. It's a picture of the throne in heaven, and so uh, tonight's going to be a really good study in Revelation, so... I invite you all to be back at 6 o'clock. I hope you have a great lunch and a great afternoon. And uh, John Brown, can I get you to pray for me?